hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. This episode is brought to you by The Food Issue from Commercial Type, a one-off online magazine as type specimen designed to show our extensive range of text faces. We were bored with the typical lazy dogs and grumpy wizards, so we commissioned six original pieces of writing centered around the theme of eating. You can experiment with how different combinations of typefaces change the overall feeling of the text as you read, and even get into the weeds with granular changes to point size and letting. Read it at foodissue.commercialtype.com. What would I do with this money? And what happiness might that bring me versus the happiness that I was getting from doing this job, which is so incredibly unique. And was the happiness of buying a small yacht or owning five Picassos going to be as great as the life I made for myself and the people I met through the magazine, and my sense of self and ability to contribute to the dialogue about national policy and my joy just being deep in the rock and roll thing? Was that close to what would I have? So instead of selling it then and making a fortune, I said just stayed around and I was there for another 10 years. This is Print is Dead, Long Live Print, a podcast about magazines and the people who made and make them. I'm Deborah Bishop. I'm Patrick Mitchell. I'm George Gendron. Imagine there's no 60s. In 1967, today's guest was a college dropout whose plan B was to start a rock and roll magazine. Plan A, kicking back, having a good time, delivering letters, and smoking dope all day as a San Francisco postal worker. But thanks to a nudge from his mentor, Ralph Gleason, and a cash infusion from his soon-to-be wife, Jane Schindelheim, Rolling Stone founder Jan Wenner dove head first into Plan B, and the rest is magazine history. Imagine there's no gonzo. Rolling Stone was an instant hit, but it wasn't until Wenner met the now legendary journalist Hunter S. Thompson and later published his Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas that Wenner found the editorial promised land. Thompson's explosive, unhinged prose created space at Rolling Stone for a legion of influential writers. Tom Wolfe, Lester Bangs, Joe Esterhaas, P.J. O'Rourke, Matt Taibbi, and many others and allowed the magazine to expand its reach from music to something much bigger. If it feels good, man, just do it. Imagine there's no Annie. In 1970, a 21-year-old newcomer was given her first paid assignment for Rolling Stone, a cover shoot with recent ex-Beatle John Lennon. In short time, Annie Leibovitz was named the magazine's chief photographer, but it was a nude portrait of teen idol David Cassidy for a 1972 cover that signaled another watershed moment for Winner. The allure of celebrity fueled the young editor's personal obsession to join the cultural elite, and the cover of Rolling Stone became his ticket in. The combination of Thompson's wild-eyed, uninhibited ramblings and Leibovitz's intimate, provocative imagery was the magic that set Winner free. Imagine all the memories. It's easy if you try. Five decades on, Rolling Stone is a boomer autobiography. Its pages filled with random notes and all the news that fits. Epic stories documenting massive successes, abject failures, and the lives and deaths of the culturally relevant, all accompanied by unforgettable photographs and game-changing design. The magazine has survived near bankruptcies, editorial scandals, cross-country moves, and yes, even that Reagan-era perception versus reality ad campaign. In the end, though, Winner's story is a somber one. Anytime a parent outlives a child, there's immeasurable sadness. Of course, Rolling Stone lives on, digital first, as they say, with new owners, and with Winner's son Gus taking the reins in 2017. But it's not the same Rolling Stone. How could it be? As for the man himself, that legacy is complicated. But in this episode, you'll get glimpses, as Rich Cohen describes in The Atlantic, of Winner's infectious charm, his gleeful, let's hope we don't get shot zeal for adventure, how contagious his enthusiasm was, and how important his loyalty could be. Winner's pen and language weren't what defined him as an editor. It was his vision and energy that attracted the best talent and inspired such memorable work. Given the name of this podcast, we really do have to start by asking you, 
if you don't mind, to recount for our listeners the emotional story of your last day in the Rolling Stone offices, right from the prologue of your book. I mean, it, it was really, really emotional and so relatable to so many people in our business. It's almost like a eulogy to a child you've lost. Well, it is. I, I do compare it to a death. And so you go through the various stages trying to accept it. And it's not until really the body is in the ground, you actually believe it. Even as sick as the patient is, you've still got the patient and the loved one around. And you hang on, you hang on, you cling and try and keep it alive. But, and even when dead, the body's still there. <laughs> yeah. It's that moment of, of burial. So that moment which I left the office to, it was empty by that time. And the chairs and the computers have been thrown in trash bins and you know, just nothing was left. I was sitting there writing, and I got a call from a friend of mine, Patty Schialfa, who's a singer, Bruce's wife. And I was telling her what I was going. She said, but why don't you just drop what you're writing and write this scene? And I did write it. Sitting there, it was, it was happening, and it turned out to be the opening scene of the book. Man, it is. It's really powerful. Well, it does make you. me wonder, though, why did you subject yourself to that? Why did you actually go into the office when the physical symbols, if you will, of what you had created were being mm -hmm. torn down and carted out? Well, I was do using it as a place to write my book. And I was set up there in my office with my writing desk and computer and research and all that stuff. So it was a convenient place to go to work. And that was the primary reason. I suppose there's a underlying psychological reason of wanting to just cling on to something I was familiar with for so long. I mean, it was it's still in my office, my office for some 30 years. As I say in the book, I had risen to fame and fortune and ruled an empire. Founders often talk about a moment in a startup where suddenly something happens. They're sitting there one day and they go, okay, this is going to work. They know it. It's not about the confidence that you bring when you launch. It's about kind of the response, the response in terms of revenue. It's like, okay, this thing is sustainable. But also people tend to feel that way when they know something is over. Was there a moment when you just knew that for you personally, this was over? I guess it was kind of a creeping dawning of reality. I mean, it, going back some years to 2008, 2009, when the ad recession started and the internet was starting to come on substantially, we were in a position where we kind of bucked it for the first year or two because our demographics were so good and were so desirable. That was just because we we're a you know, quality magazine, which goes last. And then it just it started to shrink year after year after year after year. The first couple of years of decline, you could say, oh, well, we'll turn around the advertise, sell something. But then it just became inexorable. And uh, I suppose the moment when my son and Tim Walsh, my CFO, came and said, we have to sell Rolling Stone. And then I knew always knew that if I sold Rolling Stone, you know, I was not going with it. I was too late. When would that have been, roughly? Gosh, I, the years. I don't even know what this year is. Like, end of 2017, 2018, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe 2017, 2016. I think a lot of people experience those same feelings around that same time. I want to go back now. The story about the launch of Rolling Stone, of course, is legendary. But I do want to touch on just a few quick things. The first is just a personal response I have. Every time I'm reminded that just before you launched Rolling Stone, you had taken the civil service exam. Right. Wanting to be a postal worker. <laughs> Could you explain to young kids listening to this what was so attractive about being a postal worker in San Francisco back then? Let me take you back to San Francisco then. It was a small town still. It was beautiful weather outside. Generally, always pretty good weather. And it was just, you know, if you came out of a hippie seat, I mean, the thing was you didn't really want to work. Career was, you know, no good. There was no... Big sense of ambition. I've got to go into marketing or it's time to go to business school or Wall Street for me. There was none of that. The ideal thing was just someone kick back and have a good time. So if you work for the postal service, you could go out and deliver letters or whatever and smoke dope all day. And, you know, what? what what's wrong with that? That's cool. You so know? in a way, it was perfect training for the Laundry Rolling Stone. Well, <laughs> and no, no. And no. It was like a lay safe fair time. It was a kickback era. People didn't need money that badly. There was plenty of money around. That was also starting to surface, believe it or not, even here on the East Coast, although mm -hmm. not with that same intensity. The East Coast was never as laid back. No, but I can remember with my college buddies talking about the fact that nobody wanted to, to go into a profession. Right. Everybody was trying to figure out, well, what was, are the alternatives? That was know? the cool thing. I mean, really, the 50s was a very prosperous era. Everybody was raised with some level of money. Let me just say, 
it was comfortable really for everybody. You lower middle class, you went to a good public school, you know, yeah. there are jobs aplenty. Uh, the country is so small that less than half the size it is now. Less than half the size it is now. It's amazing, isn't Think it? Think about that. Yeah. Think about New York City with half the number of people in it, for example. Anyway, and so there was no real struggle or need to survive. Your education was free. Benefits were everywhere. Your parents had money. People had second car in their garages. It was not like today. So the need to support yourself, let alone the need to do something highly ambitious, was not there. Now I want to touch on something else that I think you touch on in the prologue, and that is the mission, but you write about it in a very interesting way. I can't re recreate the actual sentence, but you're talking about the mission of the magazine, Rolling Stone, mm -hmm. but you also talk about your personal mission. And I mm -hmm. wonder, can you describe the two of those as you were thinking about them back then? Well, I think they're kind of one and the same, really. I mean, the general idea is I had developed this deep, belief and love of rock and roll, I really wanted to be part of it. It was the magic that could set you free. And I wanted to be part of it, know more about it, and just have it infuse my life. And through that, a lot of feelings were expanded, explained, developed about personal freedom, about public duty, about what society should be like, what we should stand for in our lives, having fun. What I boiled down to funny is a passion for and a belief in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Which uh, define, I think, the American dream. Or if you define it as something other than getting very rich or something. And right. that's called the foundational principles of the country. And I believed in those. And they were expressed for me through rock and roll. I found them in part through rock and roll. And they were what we were taught when we were growing up. And to grow up and go to college, discover that these things were not true, create this giant rebellion and this desire to make them become true, this fight that we all embarked on, that my generation embarked on, and that rock and roll was devoted to. Yeah. It's funny, almost everybody I knew who was my age, I'm 73 now, growing up then, they either wanted to be a rock musician or they wanted to play third base for the Yankees. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a land of choices, what can I tell you? <laughs> so you rustle up about $7,500 in startup capital. That's about, right. I don't know, 65000 in 2023 dollars. But that's and, not even, it's not even, is it even comparable? If you were to start no. a, a magazine today, you, you'd need several million dollars. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, then maybe, I don't know, you could do it for a million. You'd need a lot. Who knows? Anyway, yes. How long did that initial 7000 bucks last? To today. We just spent money as we could afford it, as we had it, and spent it, and it just, you know, just it kept alive. We didn't pay salaries. We just paid increasing expenses out of the money that would be coming in. And we didn't pay salaries. We didn't pay rent. Our only expense was food for me and my girlfriend and printing the paper itself. Right. You know, for 20 years, I ran the creative team at Inc. Magazine and chronicled the rise of the entrepreneurial economy. And Rolling Stone is kind of the classic startup story in terms of scrappy, fiercely mission-driven, unbelievably resourceful, because you got to be. And it strikes me that when you and Mick Jagger launched the UK version, it had none of those qualities. Maybe it had too much money, didn't seem to have much passion. Yeah, right. I mean, Mick represented unlimited financing to an extent. No, Not a good no, thing for a startup. Yeah. And the people starting up, they were kind of more laissez-faire in their attitudes for the things. They weren't really professional journalists or professional magazine people. They didn't kind of have that hunger or the drive for it. And the kind of passion that makes you, you know, go further on less resources. Yeah. I also think there's a quality that Rolling Stone had that felt like you were discovering and exploring with your audience rather than kind of, you, you already had all the answers and you were simply imparting it to them, if you know what I mean. Kind of mutual self-discovery. Meaning me and my readers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, probably, yeah. I think there's nothing like that in terms of a bond. That's the thing. The bond that developed between our readers and ourselves was so incredibly strong. People believed in Rolling Stone, loved Rolling Stone. It just meant the world to so many people. At so many levels, whether it was an average reader there in Paducah, Kentucky, or whether you or Mick or Bruce, who's spoken about it at length, he said we were out there in New Jersey in nowhere land, 
ho- hoping it was somebody out there like us. And Rolling Stone would come. It was like a vision of another country. They were waiting for it every two weeks, you know. It told them of all the possibilities, what they could be. And the fans who just listened to this music and loved it, I mean, God, there's another person who feels the same as I do about this. Wow. I live in this little compound on the south shore of Boston. And my neighbor here, Jay, has what he calls the 1968 Museum, which is basically about five or six rooms devoted to two things, Rolling Stone and Andy Warhol. And he was a young kid. I forget whether he was growing up in Mississippi or Texas, I think it was. And that was his lifeline to kind of a different world. That's great. So you grow up in San Francisco. The magazine really couldn't have been launched anywhere but in San Francisco. Have you thought about the relationship between a magazine's identity and place, where that magazine has its roots? And I'm curious if you felt that Rolling Stone's identity and culture changed then when you left San Francisco and moved to New York. Well, all of above. The most, in a way, kind of spiritual home of it, even more than San Francisco's Berkeley, where I went to mm-hmm. college there. And that's where all this stuff first started happening, this education in rock and roll, the local politics and drugs, and all those things really coalesced there and started to crystallize. And it was in San Francisco the year later when I was working for Rampart, so we started um, Rolling Stone. But Rolling Stone was so much reflective of that time and place. The drug scene, the rock and roll scene, this hippie thing that was going on, that kind of values and ethos that was trying to be developed there and what the Grateful Dead and the airplane were doing. And we were totally of that time and place. We obviously were trying to think internationally because the same kind of thing was happening in London with the Beatles, you know, the same kind of rock and roll scene, all that. So we're trying to think nationally, internationally, but we were such a product of that time and place. And only over the years did we start to shed some of that local stuff, started to see it in a broader sense and started to put people and writers in LA and San Francisco and London and New York. It was a broader look at things. Before we moved to New York, we had already kind of outgrown San Francisco and our fame and reputation and reach had become very national, very national. Hunter had covered the elections, the presidential elections of 72. We had by that time done the Silkwood case, the Patty Hearst case. We had interviewed John Lennon and all that. So we were a national focus already. But when we moved to New York, by that time, we'd already kind of really left behind the hippie ethos of San Francisco. That had already dissolved several years earlier. And the San Francisco rock scene had become much less intense. And of course, drugs were everywhere now. So it didn't have to be in San Francisco. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But when we moved to New York, two things happened. One is my staff for the first 10 years consists primarily of ex-newspaper guys, hard-hitting reporters, young people looking for stories, you know, really crusading to stay behind or disperse, really. And when we went to New York, we figured a lot of people were more professional magazine writers and profile writers and softer in a way. Good writers, good people. Also, we started covering more entertainment, more popular entertainment, but it was also reflective of the change in music itself. And then, of course, you get to New York and your concerns become much more cosmopolitan. They are more sophisticated, more worldly. And you've gone there really for a purpose of ambition, for a purpose of career success. And so we were very busy pursuing that as well. And we wanted to be influential in an entirely different world, the kind of literary media capital of the world. Was there a downside to that from your point of view, looking back? Well, I think, yeah, you, it's a little literary. You get distracted. There's a, a lot of dinner parties and there's a lot of entertainment. And, you know, your values are much more about career and success. So it's distracting for a while. You have to quickly get your head on it. And you can lose yourself in all that. And people right, have. Right. Some people struggle with it a little, back and forth. I struggle with it a little and end up doing what I always do. We'll be right back. Stack, the independent magazine club, delivers a different publication every month to our subscribers all around the world. You never know what we're going to send next, but you do know it will be a beautiful, intelligent, independent magazine that deserves a place on your shelf. We'd love to start sending something your way, so go to stackmagazines.com to sign up and start receiving a surprise magazine every month. Print is Dead is made possible by the support of the Society of Publication Designers. The SPD powers the future of visual storytelling, setting the standard for editorial excellence, and shaping the future of visual culture. For more information, visit spd.org. Let me switch gears, Jan, for just one second and talk about the incredible outsized role that design played 
and the success of Rolling Stone was extraordinary. As I was reading your book and rereading parts of it, I was making a list of your designers, and I can't name them all, but Roger Black, Fred Woodward, Gail Anderson, Nancy Butkus, Deb Bishop. It goes on and on and on. And then, of course, you have Leibowitz, Abaddon, La Chapelle, Herb Ritz. I mean, God, Albert Watson. And so I guess my question is, did you back then have any idea of the outsized role that design would play in Rolling Stone's success? Well, not really, but coming from Ramparts, Sunday Ramparts, they had a really strong sense of design because there's a very influential art director there named Dougal Sturmer. Copied the London Times for a lot of its tricks, techniques, and art rules, the typeface, of course, Times Roman. And so I was raised on that and the idea of elegance. I was an early reader of The New Yorker and Playboy, both of which were just really excellently designed products. And I wanted to distinguish ourselves so much from the beginning from the underground press. So I wanted typeset properly and justified columns and so forth. And so I don't know where I developed that design sense, but I really realized that the look of the magazine, as much as what you're saying, defines to the readers who you are, who you think you are, and the message you're trying to give. So my message right away was, this is a straightforward, serious, sober publication with formal rules of design, formal rules of journalism and reporting. And our first real design was my brother-in-law, Bob Kingsbury, who gave it a very fine, folksy look and design where you felt very, it was very personal. It was a very idiosyncratic design. And it, it evolved over the years, saying different things to different people. Ultimately, we started winning a lot. I always viewed the art director as my essential partner, as well as the managing editor. And I think that if you want people to read your magazine, you have to make it look good and look attractive and look inviting to have, to want to buy, to want to own. It should be something you'd be happy to sell on your coffee table. You want it in your house. You like to look at it. And it had to have that look. I was early on fans of Twin Magazine, a great art director, Willie Fleckhouse. Uh, and, yeah. that, and, you know, all those things influenced me. My wife was an art student and had a great sense of taste in the style. So I was very lucky. I liked art directors. To me, it was critical. And it was really secondary to most other places. To me, it was a major importance. Photography as well. To me, what we are covering, rock and roll, is an extremely visual thing as well as a musical thing that you write about. The looks counted. The costumes counted. All right. that counted a lot and that we had to show. And so that meant you have a visual magazine. What was your favorite story and Rolling Stone cover of all time? The all-time favorite cover has got to be A. Leibowitz's portrait of John and Yoko, the naked John curled up and holding onto Yoko which was taken you know, three or four days before he was killed. And it's won every award there is for cover, the best cover of all times, for the year, da 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 da, da. And it's partially because the picture itself shows such vulnerability and love. And uh, a friend of mine, a writer, actually, Scott Spence, called the Pieta of our times, which indeed <laughs> <That's great>. it <laughs> is. And then... Given that it is, comes out of that moment in time, that moment in history, the death of John Lennon has taken on its even more rich and extraordinary meaning. So it's certainly got to be the most powerful. It's one of the most beautifully divided and executed as well. So that's fantastic. My favorite story is much harder when you're talking about the body of work with Hunter. was amazing and so fun for me. And working with Tom Wolf and doing Bonfire of the Vannies was just a riot and laughing all the time. And I've just been reading over some of the interviews I did with Bob Dylan and John Lennon and Mick, and they were remarkable documents of people, their creative heights and their thinking. And you were asking me before about my friendships with these people, but friendships that enabled these really direct, open conversations where they're startlingly frank about what they do and looking to explain themselves. Just a footnote to what you were just saying is, were you influenced by the rise of the album cover? which was kind of a design frontier and an art form in and of itself. Yes and no. We were always aware of it, but we weren't trying to design like album covers. Obviously, there's a piece of design we saw all the time. I guess we were influenced by certain lettering things. Or It was in yeah. the air. It was in the air. We were more influenced by the poster artists of San Francisco, in a way, like Rick Griffin and Stanley Mouse and Wes Wilson by the album covers. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But now I want to fast forward, and I want to talk to you about something you touch on in the book, but I would have loved to have heard more, and that's about making money. 
So you, at one point, you you start to think about, well, how much is enough? How much is too much? And in fact, I think you go and have a conversation with Jerry Garcia. Right. And Garcia says something that a lot of very, very smart and wise entrepreneurs have said, which is maybe you're too big when you don't know the names of everybody you work with. Right. But you know, you get to a point at your peak where you've got Look Magazine, Family Life, Record Magazine, mm-hmm. Us Weekly, Men's Journal, Glixel, kind of the winner media. I think at one point you guys were yeah. thinking about doing restaurants. Uh, yeah, that, that there's a, yeah, somewhere. I don't know. Okay, that was an outlier. But I just those thought, are people that approach us and want to license our name. We never really thought of getting into it. So, in your mind, what was your ambition? People sometimes refer to, to you wanting to be kind of a 21st century Henry Luce maybe wanting to build the next generation Condé Nast. I never was that ambitious 10 years after coming to New York, or even before coming to New York, when we started outside, a magazine which still thrives. Simultaneously, had two things came to mind. One is I wanted to turn over being a day-to-day editor to somebody else. I want to be less involved. And I felt I learned a lot about magazines, and I wanted to put that knowledge and the kind of staff structure we developed, the expertise, to leverage that into other magazines. And I thought I knew how to do that. And I had a couple of ideas for magazines I wanted to try out. And so I really wanted to use Rolling Stone and go into the magazine business as well as the Rolling Stone business. And I pursued that yeah. for a number of years. And I more or less knew what I was talking about. I still had some big expensive lessons to learn. And I enjoyed being a magazine publisher. And I tried to that section of the book, Building the Empire. And we were lucky in having a couple of good magazines and one wildly successful magazine. So at the end of the day, I could look back on the career and say, well, you know, I started five or six magazines, four of them still exist, and two of them are huge hits. Was that enough for you? Yeah, then by the time I had the second huge hit, by that time the internet was coming out to destroy the magazine business. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of my culture. Read our online journal, listen to our podcast, and visit our shop discover why we're convinced print is very much alive. All available at magculture.com. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Issues Magazine Shop. Much like this podcast, we exist to celebrate the people and projects keeping print alive. We sell a mix of independent and commercial titles from around the world, shipping globally from our retail shop in Toronto, Canada. Visit us online at issuesmagshop.com. You mentioned in this context that at one point you had an offer to sell at the top of the market. Right. But you don't provide any details at all. Can you Uh, share more about that? Well, I provide the details of my thinking about whether to take the offer or not, in which I really go through the analysis that I made at the time, which is what would I do with this money? And what happiness might that bring me versus the happiness that I was getting satisfaction from doing this job, which is just incredibly unique. And... You know, was the happiness of buying a small yacht or owning five Picassos going to be as great as the life I made for myself and the people I met through the magazine and my sense of self and ability to contribute to the dialogue about national policy and my joy in just being deep in the rock and roll thing? Was that close to what I So instead of selling it then and making a fortune, I said just stayed around and I was there another 10 years. Yeah. And what would I have done? I've been bored. I couldn't start another Rolling Stone. You know, I might start other magazines, they might do this, they might that, but nothing was going to bring the satisfaction that I had with Rolling Stone. I'm curious, there was obviously a period, and a pretty extensive one, at Rolling Stone where you really were immersed in the issue-by-issue creation. And then, of course, as time goes on, your energies start to focus on a much broader array of projects and stuff. Do you ever look back and think, Man, my my best moments were X. Not in that context. I do remember destroying the special thrill and drill of working on an issue, of approving layouts and copy editing. And, then, of course, all the fun of the deadline that everybody hates at the time but realizes it was just too much fun. It was like being with the gang and playing, you know, whether all-nighters or not. But the, the, the actual creative moments were great. The magazine, if I was involved in that issue, it was generally much better. I could sharpen the layouts. I could do the Every time I could bring my touch to it, you know, there'd always be improvements. The headlines would be funny or whatever it was. And when I stepped away, it was extremely good. Probably not as good as I could have gotten. It was always the dilemma, but I had other things I wanted to do. What was it like when you were 
<laughs> your offices were, I forget they were in the early days, in, in the typesetters. We were in the printer's loft. We had a, there was a printer's loft, printer that's right. Building in upstairs above the Goss Community Press that they had downstairs. They had a type shop with about a dozen linotype machines, big loft where they stored all these rolls of paper. I mean, cute, heavy things. And an ink melting smelter or something where they would melt all the lead type down and burn all of the ink that was left on the lead, yeah. which was the smell we lived with for a long time. It brings back memories. I, there was nothing like actually closing a story when you were down at the typesetter side yeah. by side with the typesetter himself, man. But the question I wanted to ask was, what was it like for you when you grabbed that first issue of volume one, number one of Rolling Stone as it came off the press? Well, it was, I don't know, sometime in the evening and our first staff photographer, Bear Walden was there, another great photographer who should have been mentioned. And they came off, you know, it was on cheap paper. It was folded in half. And if you picked it up, you smudged the ink on your fingers. You're just coming out the prices, but it's smudged anyway. And I just looked at it. I was through it. I thought, geez, this is, you know, we're never going to do as good again. We've already peaked. You know, this is as good as it can ever get. <laughs> I really thought the dilemma was how to be, get better. And how lo and behold. Blind self-confidence. Yeah, but I think what you're getting at is, again, something that Adam Moss and I were talking about. A lot of people bring it up in our podcast, and that is kind of this sense of actually making something real, something tangible that you hold in oh, your hands. Yeah. Man, there's this kind of psychic thrill that you get that maybe you don't get from almost any other process. I don't know. I mean, when the book came about a year ago, whenever I first got the first copies of it, all bound, you'd look at it, you hold it, you smell it really i went to sleep with it, I put it in my bed and the physical you know manifestation of something that came from your was holy from your mind holy a work of imagination is very very powerful i mean it, it it is a real it's like in a sense really dreams that have transmogrified into being true it's transubstantiated your brain into an actual object it's a miracle that is a miracle the turning of something into flesh People ask me, how could you possibly stay at Inc. for 20 years? And, of course, part of the answer is that it, <laughs> the, the world and the market was changing so radically that the magazine was changing year over year. So it wasn't the same job. But the other was, I agree with you, it's a great word. It, it was like chronicling a miracle. The magazine really was about documenting the process that people go through when they transform an idea into something tangible. It's, it's thrilling. Another question that comes to mind that I think a lot of journalists cope with to this day, and that is managing the tension between a relationship that forms between you and the subject, let's call it a friendship, and journalism itself. And you were really close friends with many of the people that you ended up writing about. How did you manage that? What kinds of conflicts did it create for you? Springsteen is the godfather of one of your kids, for God's sake. <laughs> well, I mean... Let's divide this into two things. What are these people like as subjects and what are they like as friends? Talking about, let's talk about the very famous stars I was very friendly with. Or even the record company executives who are not so right. famous, who I had relationships with professionally and personally. First off, the business that we were covering, the record business, unlike traditional American businesses, is about making art, about making people feel good, about the creative process, about good people in their imagination. And particularly in this one, there's a lot of soul and spirit and beliefs underlying more so say than other creative business like the movies or television, which are really substantially commercial and somewhat cynical enterprises, particularly television. But this was about doing good. And the people in the record were nice people. Nobody was making faulty cars or bad washing machines or selling cigarettes, anything. So the idea of having to do investigative reporting on them and harsh stuff was not unknown, but it was not really the business. It was not what was meant to be, what our mission was, what was called for. Occasionally, there'd be things like the prices of CDs, the attempt to shut down home taping. There'd be a few business issues where you had to stand up. That wasn't difficult. But so you couldn't go to an artist and say, well, I need to investigate Bruce Springsteen or uh, Mick Jack. It just didn't call for it. What we were there for, and what I was interested in, was we want to explore them artistically and thoughtfully, but they're intellectually thinking is, what the creative process is, what they stood for, their belief systems. The one time, the only real time it got in the way of a friendship was 
when we had to cover Altamont in 1969 and lay the blame in part to the Rolling Stones for why that happened. This is after Mick and I had been publishing Rolling Stone together. And so, you know, we were close associates at the time and friends and all of a sudden. And I knew it would put this at risk, but I just really had no choice but to go ahead with this and report the story. That's a major piece of journalism. It was a murder, a killing, a bunch of issues that were not necessarily part of the creative. But in any case, then let's look at the people themselves. Bruce, Mick, these are wonderful people. They are people so smart, so good in their own thing that they understand my process and my needs and my creative needs and the principles I live with and have to honor and what journalists are. There is a natural guardianist that one starts out with, but over a period of years, you know each other really well. And you don't doubt the friendships going either way. I mean, I understand and love creative people, and I know how that works, what the creative process is like, and it's different for everybody, and how it affects the ego, and how you think, and how you perceive things, what you're looking for, is a, how, how talent works. And so I'm very sympathetic and like it. So we get to talk. There's so much mutual that we have together as well as family. You just develop friendship. I mean, I like the people. I never felt compromised. Nobody ever said, give me a good review or a bad review. The respect goes both ways. And nobody would expect me, who know me well, to do anything like that. So I never felt any way compromised to do something or not do something. There was never that. There was always an implicit understanding that I looked after their interests as friends, you know. But it is a two-way street of respect. I want to wrap this up by quoting something that you wrote in the book, and it's, the battles about the legacy of the 60s continue, known mm-hmm. today as culture wars. Mm-hmm. From my first day of college, it seemed we were on trial for intergenerational crimes. And then later, but very closely related, you go on to say, this book is a report on today's world and how we got here. So Jan, as someone who has chronicled the journey from the 60s to where we are today, where are we now? The period that's called the 60s or the baby boom or the post-war generation has really significantly reshaped the country and its values and its morals and what the country stands for. I mean, the progress on human rights issues, whether it's racism, sex, women's equality, all these things, they're so far advanced at this point, so far more advanced than you could have ever imagined they would get from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago. Remember, Obama was afraid to come out for gay rights, for gay marriage. I know it's until Biden forced him. And now, of course, <laughs> it's a right. And the generation took on now the biggest crisis, the climate crisis, the environmental situation. And these are not resolved issues by any means. And there's still things we're fighting about and for, but I think most of this is just embedded in the American society now. There's no going back on abortion, no matter what the fights are now. There's a right to it still exists. Maybe it's limited in some place. Maybe you have to go other places for it. Maybe it's being overturned. I don't know. They're not going to go back on gay marriage. You know, that's sad. If they do, big things are going wrong. The big issue today is climate. And there we are as a generation, as a society as a whole, our generation has fought hard on this issue. But we are up against now the most powerful force in the world. This is not just being up against the legislature, or people you can vote out of office in your state, or being influenced by public opinion and where we can go on the streets and protest. We're fighting the biggest, best fighting, greediest, most powerful force on earth. Not just the United States, but in collaboration with the people in Moscow and people in Saudi Arabia and other places where they control the vast carbon resources, where people are regularly killed, slaughtered, killed for these things. So whether it's control of the rainforest or control of this Middle Eastern government. So we're in the biggest fight ever now. That's what we're in. Everything else is on its way to being finally won, I think. But if we can't win the climate fight, not only do we face short-term peril of disease, we share mid-term peril of vast population changes and migrations and refugees, which will destroy democracy and self-government and all kinds of freedoms that we now enjoy, and long-term extinction, or at least maybe there'll be 100 million of us left living on the North Pole. So where are we in an extremely hopeful place because we're moving fast in a lot of directions, but also in an extremely desperate situation because we've met a huge enemy and we don't quite have the tools. It's yeah. interesting listening to you talk. My wife and I were watching Baz Luhrmann's Elvis last yeah. night and we, uh-huh. we paused it halfway through. And whatever else you think about the movie, I think the kid's performance was breathtaking. Yeah. But my wife turned to me and said, it is astonishing when you think about how far the culture has come really in such a short time. And we forget that. 
we forget that. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number of times I've been hanging out with my buddies and my colleagues mm -hmm. and friends, and they start to talk about, oh, my God, as a generation, we have really screwed everything up. And I think, no, that That's is true so at not all. true. No. In part, my purpose in writing this book was to tell people, no, we haven't. We've got a lot to be proud of. We made a huge, huge difference. Enormous difference. Think about the 50s. They throw people in jail who are gay. They castrate them. They could do that. Blacks were <laughs> you know, there was still Jim Crow going. That was ridiculous. Yes. I mean, couldn't yeah. vote, couldn't use the same drinking fountain. On and on and on. I mean, women you know, could cook. And that was all. It's come so far in such a short period of time, in my lifetime. And I think younger people today are passionate about the environment. And they see this as critical. I mean, it's their future. And the same way they were against the war because we were going to get drafted and killed. If they don't solve climate, these are the people, our children, other people are going to get killed, die of asphyxiation. So. Yeah. So I'm proud of my generation. And I'm, I'm glad proud to hear of what that. I did. And I, I'm proud of the magazine I put out. I think all these things were historical, important, groundbreaking, meant a lot to everybody and people in their lives and to the country. Jan Winter's autobiography, Like a Rolling Stone, a memoir, which the New York Times called Entertaining in Spades, is available wherever books are sold. If you'd like to connect more deeply with our guests, be sure to visit our website where we have complete transcripts of all our interviews, along with portfolios, archival photos, links, and other great information. Visit longliveprint.co slash interviews for more. In other news, we've got swag. Yep, you can get Print is Dead merch on our site at longliveprint.co slash shop. All purchases go directly to supporting the podcast. Check back often. We're adding new stuff all the time. And finally, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter by using the form on our homepage. It's the best way to stay up to date on all of the Print is Dead news and to receive advance notice on the latest episodes. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a member of the Hub & Spoke Audio Collective, a nonprofit association of audio storytellers dedicated to promoting and sustaining high-quality independent podcasting, including Nocturne, a show that opens our ears to the abundance of experiences we miss after the sun goes down, says The Guardian. No two episodes are the same, and its blended form of storytelling strikes a beautiful balance between audio documentary and sound art. No matter what time of day you listen, Nocturne is the perfect guide to the loneliest hours of the night. For more, visit nocturnepodcast.org or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Your contributions are the lifeblood of this podcast. Here's how you can support us in this work. One, become a sustaining patron by making a monthly donation. Or two, make a one-time donation in the amount that works best for you. Visit printisdead.co slash support for more information. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a production of Modus Operandi Design. For more information, visit our website, printisdead.co. Or if you're an optimist, longliveprint.co. Follow us on social media at printisdeadpod. Please give us a like and a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps. Thanks very much for listening.